Kia ora everyone, welcome to Politics in Full Sentences, your thoughtful take on the week's political happenings with a strong lashing of free markets and most of all free minds. Joining with me today is the leader of the ACT Party, David Seymour. G'day. And it's a privilege to welcome former Finance Minister Ruth Richardson to the studio today. Welcome. Greetings, thanks. Great to be here. Now, there's a whole, I've got a little run sheet about what we're going to talk about. I know Ruth, you wanted to talk about David as well. Um, first of all, following the run sheet, you want to talk about Fonterra. Now, there's, there's been a, it's been in the news a little bit. Should it ever have been established, Ruth? First uh, question. Unequivocally, this. no. And these were your questions, yeah. not mine. Unequivocally, no. Uh, Fonterra is a fail on two counts. One is it's failed against its own lofty goals. Mm. It sold its shareholders short. It's trashed the share price. Uh, and uh, it, it's disgraceful uh, that we take our precious resources uh, and sell them at sort of the lowest common denominator. But the, the first thing, it's failed its lofty goals, mm. uh, sold its shareholders short. But I think even arguably more damaging, it's failed New Zealand. It, it sold New Zealand short. We've got this precious resource, land, pasture systems, uh, stewardship of, of natural resources, water, air, uh, and effectively, Fonterra is taking this wonderful, high-value, premium resource, turning it into a lowest common denominator commodity, mm. and depriving the country of the ability to turn that premium resource into a premium product and sell it for premium prices. Ruth, you know, one of the things, you know, uh, Joe Public generally sees Fonterra as a great company, good branding, good image. I mean, how was it actually set up? I know David had, you know, briefly mentioned this to me earlier. I'd, I'd love to know a bit more so that the, the average average bloke voting out there or bloke or lady that, that, that wants to understand this a little bit more would love to know how, how did, how did uh, Fonterra come about? Oh, well, I, I, I can do this one. Okay, um, <laughs> Look, I, I mean, basically, you know, to have a monopoly of that scale that would normally be illegal. You know, we have competition laws in this country. Mm. And what happened is a group of good old mostly boys got together, and, and this is why I really don't like it. It was cringy. It was cultural cringe. It was the thought that we New Zealanders can have a really big company that will go and sock it to the others um, on the world stage. And uh, of course, that's really great if you have a successful company that really is doing innovative stuff and grows up and competes. And that's that's what one of the things ACT stands for, one of the things we want. But when you require an act of parliament to establish it in the first place, mm. and that was required, the, the Dairy Industry Restructuring Act, to actually circumvent the normal competition laws and make it possible, uh, that's never going to be a good start because it was always going to be inherently a product of politics. And as we always say, you know, you, you don't get rich from, through politics. You know? uh, well, some people do, but that's called corruption. Some of the moves of Fonterra, particularly, you know, I'm even speaking with the uh, Waikato Chamber of Commerce CEO, Chris Simpson, said, you know, the move out yeah. of Waikato to come into Auckland City just yeah. seemed like, you know, it's a yeah. corporate... And, and Chris used to work with Ruth, and that's not, there's not a yeah. conspiracy here. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, I mean, to, to go to its origins, the Commerce Commission said no. Mm. And there were 58 reasons they had to give in order to overcome those hurdles. So they basically ripped up the Commerce Commission uh, draft determination. Mm. They went running to Helen Clark. Uh, who said, oh, yes, you'll be the national champion. Yeah, mm. right. Uh, and every single party in Parliament voted for it, except to their huge credit act. Okay, that's really interesting. What, then, that's great, but what's the alternative? Oh, the alternative is very clear. Uh, so you take two companies listed on both the New Zealand and Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, I declare my interest. I'm a director of one, was the first... Uh, independent director of Sinlay Milk. Yeah. Uh, our share price, since we listed, has gone up 300%. Fonterra's has dropped by 50%. Wow. Uh, or you take the A2 Milk Corporation that Fonterra 20 years ago said to you, it's phony science, don't believe it, get out of here. Mm. And A2 Milk Corporation is now vastly more profitable uh, and vastly more valuable uh, than Fonterra would ever be. So you've got the classic corporation or yeah. you've got a hybrid. 
So Silver Fern Farms, for example, was a cooperative, yeah. failed as yeah. Fonterra is failing and as Westland has just failed. Uh, so the bankers basically dictated the pace and they divided up Silver Fern Farms, which was one of the biggest meat companies in New mm. Zealand, into a holding company that the cooperative uh, effectively is maintained, but it has 50% of the ownership of the hybrid. They get rations, but no say. So they'd like a holding company of 50%, yeah. but the actual operating company is now more in a classic uh, corporate mode. You know, where all the incentives are right, uh, where you know your cost of capital, you don't mm. have vaguely defined mm. property rights, uh, you, your shareholders are not conscripts. It's as, about accountability, as the really, isn't it? Well, it's about performance. Yeah. yeah what, what, what is the? I think Fonterra is a, a systemic failure of a business structure, just as protectionism was a systemic failure in trying to create a growing and competitive economy. And until that business structure is addressed, mm. Fonterra will continue to dive. But it's a religion. You know, the religion is, you know, Fonterra, cooperative, you know, that's the only way that, that dairy farmers can prevail. Well, you know, look at Silver Fern Farms, look at Westland. They can fail, and they do. What, what, so what next? What next? What next for Fonterra, given well, that they are failing? I mean... Wh- th- 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 there has to be, I think, uh, a, uh, an insurgency. Uh, an insurgency at the shareholder level. Uh, I, you know, it's the property rights of, of the dairy farmers who mm. choose to do business mm. with Fonterra. I'm not going to trash their property rights. Mm. Their value has been trashed by Fonterra. Mm. Uh, five people get over a million dollars. A quarter of all the employees of Fonterra get over a hundred thousand uh, dollars. But the people who own it mm. have to take the responsibility to deal with it. Yeah. I worry, however, about the degree to which New Zealand is on the wrong end of this equation. You know, what are we doing with these valuable resources which we know we've got to live within planetary limits? What the hell are we doing Mm. allowing a business model like this to prevail when it's so demonstrably going to take us to a race to the bottom? Yeah, yeah. Look, I I mean, a race to the bottom in any industry is never a good thing. Um, David, any any further thoughts? Is there anything you want to add on this this topic? Oh, well, just what what Ruth has has just alluded to, that there's also an environmental aspect of this. And there's always people who say, well, you cannot have limitless economic growth uh, on a finite planet. Uh, And I've always said that's that's simply not true, uh, for the reason that you can make more and more valuable stuff out of the same resources. Mm. That's called technology. That's Mm. called innovation. Um, But the Fonterra model has basically been to see how much land you could get into, how much intensity of production and ship, how much milk powder burnt with, you know, how much coal and gas to burn it down, uh, shipped to the Mm. other side of the world. I mean, if you're an environmentalist, and people think you can't be a free marketeer like ACT people and and be an environmentalist, actually, uh, you can't be an environmentalist if you don't believe in markets and innovation yeah, yeah. and technology. It's getting mm. better living standards and more growth out of the same resources. But but Fonterra's model inherently is about growing by consuming more products at, at the same level of value. So, look, I, I think there's a really strong mm. environmental story there in this is, that often is. gets missed. But here's, here's a really scary thing. You know, in the first eight years of Fonterra's existence, the mm. farmers, and Pete Fraser uses this example, the farmers spent more on plastic ear tags for their cows mm. than Fonterra retained by way of earnings to grow a business so it could innovate and thrive. Duh. Wow. It's unbelievable. Okay. I, so really, I mean, I, I'm just sort of trying to <laughs> still process that. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I mean, how much does a plastic ear tag, do they have one in each ear? Just, uh, no? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're quiet. Are they like really fashionable ones? You've got a track and track. No, no, yeah, no just no, ordinary, no. ordinary all flex uh, Ruth, you, tags, you, yeah. You, you've, you've, seen, you've seen many, many garments come and go. What's your take on the current one? Well, this is what I thought swimming this morning. I do all my best analysis when I'm in chlorine. Because. So swimming this morning, uh, this is what I thought. Mm. This is a government that specialises in virtue signalling. This is a man that specialises in virtue substance. You look at the causes that David is advancing, the courageous cause of uh, euthanasia, mm. for example. 
the willingness to say to kids, you've got to get the best chance out of an education system, and therefore we're going to back choice in schools. Mm. You know, the, 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 the willingness uh, to argue for competition. Everybody's up and arm about petrol prices. What a surprise this week we get an inquiry. What does it show? Where there's competition, the consumer is better off. That's what right. a surprise. Who's the man who's the voice for that? So we've got a government that specialises in virtue signalling, mm. but I think the stars, the scales are falling from the mm. eyes. The stardust belongs on the front cover of Vogue, but in fact, increasingly New Zealanders are saying, Oi, mind the gap. Mm. That's the promise. What about the performance? You know, what's the performance on productivity? What's the performance on housing? What's the performance on education? Mm. What's the performance on health? If you're a bloke and you get prostate cancer, you are much more likely to die in New Zealand because it's on a waiting list Mm. than if you had a competitive system. So I think they're a rookie government. I think they're saved by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which is the gift that keeps on giving. Mm. But they're either rookie, they don't know what they know, or they're rabid. Like, you know, the Minister of, of Education, you know, completely mm. rabid about what has to be done. And, you know, you get an economic out, out downturn and all, you know, as, as Buffett said, you know, when, when, the, when the tide goes out. Well, you, you, know, you know, who, you know, out, you know who's swimming naked. I yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, exactly. Well, <laughs> well, that's, uh, look, look th- thanks for your, your, your kind words. But can we talk a bit about you? Because the, the, the Fiscal Responsibility Act is the gift that, that keeps, g- keeps on giving. And in an incredible bit of petty peak, um, yeah. Michael yeah, Cullen. If you could please give a yeah. layman's version of Fiscal Responsibility Act. What does well, it do? What does well, it stand well, for? I, I, the very simple history, and I stand to be corrected, but Paul, Paul Ruth became the Minister of Finance in 1990, and, and what she didn't know is that the, the country was completely bankrupt. Mm. Um, and in a way, there was a justice to it because six years earlier when the government changed uh, Muldoon had, had said to David Longy ha, 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 we got a surprise for you in the morning yeah. um, so every time a government was elected they didn't know what state the books were in okay. and the incentive for a politician was to basically run the country bankrupt or run the government bankrupt uh, and if you got through the next election then you'd have to deal with it but there was no incentive to actually run responsible books and so there were two issues one the accounting was crap yeah. Um, and two, there was no requirement to actually publish it. And so what a combination of you know, our founder, Roger Douglas, with the Public Finance Act, and Ruth um, as the, the next finance minister with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, it said, first of all, let's have the world's first totally inclusive accrual accounting. And I know people get mm. bored about accounting, but it's really important that you can actually measure the all-in cost of what government's doing. If you get that wrong, um, you'll find yeah. out pretty quick well, well, in, yeah. in private well, look, well, look, in your business, yeah. you, you know, you don't sort of lie to yourself about the figures. And have a yeah, thing, right. but, yeah. but the government's said this for generations. So, so you know, Ruth, uh, I, if it's possible for me to fangirl, I fangirl over Ruth, because Ruth fixed that. Um, and and Roger, Roger fixed that. But, of course, like a lot of things, if I say one thing about this government, I mean, they are great at marketing and they are mm. weak on substance, I agree. But they are, they do have, uh, you know, it's a little bit superficial and misguided, we would say, but they do have a bit of reformer seal. I mean, they do want to reopen debates about public accounting and have different types of accounting and so on. I mean, have you paid much attention to yes. what they're proposing? Yes, I, I think the, the wellbeing budget uh, is all spin and no substance. Uh, because how can you have a budget that says, I care about people's mental well-being, mm. I will allocate uh, $1.9 billion to mm. fix it. So why are we doing it? We care about people's mental health. What are we doing? We're making an allocation. How are we doing it? No idea. Don't know. Don't know. There, there's nothing allocated. Or, or children who are of special needs. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to, to the defence of Jacinda here because I think the well-being signal is actually, it's important. And, and, I, and I keep saying this. I think I mentioned this on an earlier podcast. It's the well-being of the productivity, the feeling people get from actually who, being active. Who, who said that we weren't concerned about well-being? Exactly. They've hijacked that. Nonsense. That, that, it's just some moral high ground. Yeah. Let, let's look at how they actually deliver. If they were serious about well-being, You'd they'd radically plan. reform the education system because that's how you break the cycle of disadvantage. If they were serious about well-being, mm. we wouldn't let you know failed, um, clapped out um, individuals try and run hospital wards. For goodness sake, and then have to put in, 
commissioners. So I won't have it. I won't yield high ground to those who say, you just say it's well-being and it happens. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's, um, you know, I, I commend reformist instincts. Yeah. I, I commend, it was the Greens who insisted on a, on a budget responsibility rules. Mm. Uh, and so that, that's the responsible part of this government. Uh, but the idea that you can just have these these airy fairy worthy targets mm. and not be held to account for delivering on them, I mean the voters are not like that. Mm. Look at Kiwi Build, you know it's magical we're going to do this. We don't deliver, and the pe- and you know and the the punters say, excuse me, we mind the gap, mm. uh, and this this is a really big fail. But yeah. come come back to this yeah. man. But but well, well actually I mean just while we're on the topic because sort of related is this proposal this week that. We're going to have a parliamentary budget office. So, you know, if you want to run for parliament, you've sort of go, got to go to parliament and get your ideas tested by, by parliamentary officials first. And I, I have a very strong view about this, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what you no, think. No, where are you going? Well, I think it's an outrage. I mean, we, we send people to parliament to keep the government and the politicians under control. Mm. Um, and the idea that your ideas have to go through the filter of the establishment before you, before the people send you there, yeah. I mean, it's just a total misunderstanding. It's, it, 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 we, you know, the people are, are, the, are sending their representatives to Wellington, uh, not people that some Wellington institution has approved of. Yeah. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, I mean, Ruth will have some war stories, and she was probably a lot more, she was a lot more effective than me, but you win an election, you get there, and actually, the bureaucrats are the enemy. You know, you, we, in, in doing charter schools, we had to get several Ministry of Education bureaucrats fired from their jobs for deliberately obstructing us. Mm. Um, now, you know, the idea that they have a go at you before you even get elected as well That's right, uh, is yeah. shocking. So I'm, I'm completely opposed to this. Yeah, so almost everyone else on the right is in favour. Right, I think well, it's well, look, look let, let, let's look. What's, what's the gold standard? First of all, the ideas have to be gold standard. I mean, yeah. I first knew David, mm. young guy, shiny suit. Uh, and he was a man of principle then, and he's a man of principle now. Yeah. Uh, he knows where his North Star is. So you have to know where, where the North Star mm. is, what's going to guide your decision-making. Mm. Then you need to show performance. Right? Um, then you need to show relevance. Are you actually intervening mm. uh, in a way that makes any sense? Is, mm. is the proposed parliamentary budget office really relevant mm. to how uh, political parties and candidates and, and voters um, th- think about the equation when they go into the ballot box and you have to have trust yeah. uh, and every time there's a big fail uh, that's the issue that Fonterra yeah. faces they are losing the trust Definitely. of their shareholders right. and same for politicians mm. you've got to perform, you've got to be relevant yeah. uh, and you, public policy matters, it matters a lot yeah. uh, to the kind of behaviour, but in the end you know, it, it's that's that's this the scene setting. It, it's our spirit. It's it's our DNA. It's 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 our innovative juices. It's our smarts. They're going to make this country. David, you're 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 on a you're on a real real winning winning uh, uh, winning. Uh, what's the word? You're you're actually getting complimented quite a bit. In fact, talking to people out there, uh, one thing that that people always say, oh, act. You know, they they're not sure about. And one thing I keep repeating to them exactly what you said, Ruth, about the North Star and being consistent. You want to know about how to build trust? Be consistent. And I think sometimes that's almost a challenge that you have as, as, as ACT is that you're going to yeah. be consistent on, say, for example, end-of-life choice. It's about giving people a choice and giving them the liberty and the, the, the freedom to make their own choice. Yet that's cost you, I guess, you know, potentially or in the past without them having a proper uh, analysis of it they've gone oh we're, we're conservative we're christian we do not want to get involved in this and and gone away at that and i and i and i urge people out there me personally to actually look at it because when you are going to be representing i guess all things to all people uh very difficult to to almost kind of say oh no no i represent just the conservative or this 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 sort of sector of a of a of, of the tribe so look i commend you look on that. look it's it's people that make the difference. public policy matters but it's it's the actors it's the people mm. that make the difference i've written on a power tool notepad <laughs> yeah, david like seymour it. he brings courage coherence consistency and clarity yeah. to the domain and you know you you rehabilitate politics. You get people like David being prepared to be in the domain. Mm. That's how you secure the powering up uh, of New Zealand in every sense. So That's I'm right. not for the stardust and well-being. I'm for powering us up, 
and performance. Good policy, good results, and I think consistency is a, is, is a critical thing. And, and, and what well, advice do you have to the ACT Party? Well, well it's probably it's a great time to mention that, that we have just opened our School of Practical Politics for the 2020 election cycle. Oh, and so we've got a great course. We teach people about how to deal with the, the media um, and how to plan a campaign and how to answer a question and what our policy orientation is because um, we actually want to, you know, we want to get some more people into Parliament. We want them mm. to be good people and we want to have representatives out there campaigning for us. We, we want them to know how to campaign, you know, efficiently and, and get our message across. So, um, look, people should sign up. We've already had about a dozen people in the first two days who, you know, want to sign yeah, up and maybe great. maybe that's be ACT candidates. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can do that on our website, School of Practical Politics. Um, and who knows? Hopefully I mean, you can put you know, a link on the podcast. The yeah, I'm sure we can. And, 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 you, and you too could, could have Ruth Richardson saying nice things about you. So that's, that's something, right. Something yeah, to, that's exactly Something to aim right. for. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, um, last Is that question. Ah, uh, well. That, no, no, he's taking that, a leaf out of the Ukraine where I've worked. Yeah. A big revolution. And yeah. then it all turned to custard because nobody did anything. So a guy who played an actor, the prime minister, so yep. the president, he got elected. Totally rookies. Everybody never ever been there. The first thing he did was shove them all in a, in a cold room and put them through the school of practical politics <laughs> for, for, for a week. Good for him. Well, that's outstanding. But it, but it does it does show. I mean, part of the reason we're here as ACT is that people have become so disillusioned with their, their politicians. And personally, I just think it, you know politicians in the West have said, "Look, you give us a third or half your income." And we'll mm. give you prosperity and a bit of social mobility. So, you know, basically everyone's going to be okay and anyone can make it. That's that's basically the deal. Mm. Um, and people around the world are saying, well, hang on, this just hasn't worked. Mm. I mean, the people who really needed help haven't got help from the welfare state. Yeah. The people who are going to do okay anyway did okay anyway. They just have to pay a third of their income in tax. Yeah. Um, and the higher the taxes, the more riotous people are. You look at France, I mean, they could go back to beheading people at any time. Mm-hmm. And they got a 75% tax rate and they're getting mm-hmm. the same crappy mm-hmm. results. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, you made me think of it with the Ukrainians. I mean, they got, they got so sick of <laughs> their politicians that they took a comedian who played a fictional president yeah, in some yeah, Ukrainian yeah. TV drama yeah. and they elected him as the yeah. actual president. Yeah. And I just think that's it's outstanding at, at a comedic level. Yeah. But... but, but <laughs> But but it also shows what happens if, if you don't deliver, and and I hope that you know what what ACT can do. I mean, I think we really did it with charter schools. That's what one ACT MP could do, That's and so you know our aspiration is that actually there's a whole lot of areas across the housing market. Kiwi builds a joke. We've mm. told people how you could do it better. Welfare dependency is terrible. I mean, prisons are a joke. I mean, you know you've got people. Half the people there are back inside after four years. Now, how dumb do you have to be to have people who are like the ultimate captive audience? Mm. I mean, they literally (laughs) cannot leave. And we do nothing to to try and rehabilitate them, give them 320 bucks, send them on the way. By the way, don't go back to your old gang affiliates, commit crime and get sent back, uh, which half of them do within four years. So, you know, we we, we could actually do so much better, but governments are such an underperforming sector. Mm. Takes too much, doesn't do enough, and people replace us with comedians. (laughs) So, you know, that's that's our tax mission. Maybe that's the way. You You should be taking this school it of, of comedy you know and have a tv show and, yeah, and maybe <laughs> maybe we and maybe people would maybe well maybe if since comedians are going to politics politics go politics, well, go into politics com- has turned into comedy last last thing to table i've been very because t- i've been an agent of change all of my life in politics and business in my own life and i've been very taken it's a boston consulting group kind of construct but it talks about head heart and hands your head is, what are, the, what are the big rocks? What's your big ambition? Mm. You know what this guy's ambition is. I know what my ambition is for New Zealand. We live on the edge. We, we want to basically power ourselves up mm. and, and you know, act, act in a way that secures, you know, huge premium yeah. uh, return for our products. So that's the head. That's the big ambition. Uh, your heart is, you know, have you got the right team on the bus? Have you got the right kind of strategy, you know, in order to deliver against mm. that objective? And then hands is how you execute. Do you execute? Do you innovate with mm. agility? Mm. The trouble is, if you have a look at so much of public policy, you know, the, 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 the head is certainly, um, the heart may be there and the hands yeah. are bloody useless. There's a, mind the gap. Mind yeah, the gap. Right. Yeah. Hey, so, hey Ruth, wonderful. it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for coming in. <laughs> it's pleasure. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's, it's actually great. absolutely wonderful. Uh, pleasure to have you. Before we go, everyone, I just want to thank the team here at uh, Podcast NZ. 
Uh, and we look forward to joining you again next week for another episode of Politics in Full Sentences. Good evening. Good evening. What do you think, Christian? Okay. Would you vote for this boy? Amazing. There you go. <laughs> that was great. And, and all I got... All